guys, and uh, yeah, glad you guys came. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I know the weather is delightful outside for post-Mother's Day, basically almost Memorial Day even. So uh, glad you could make it. Um, all right. So we're here to talk about crypto and the law. Like, this is sort of a follow-up presentation. I know we talked a little bit about uh, Andy did a presentation with Alex on some OPSEC. And so we're trying to bring in a little bit of, little bit of insight about crypto and how it interacts with the law. Some of you may have remembered a case last year about the San Bernardino uh, terrorist and uh, how, and then the Apple versus FBI case that followed. So uh, it's always a relevant issue. The crypto wars have been on again, off again, I guess, over the last 20 years or so. And so what we wanted to do was kind of bring some context and, and give you a little bit of information about what that is, where it comes from, what it means, and, uh, and, and help you understand exactly what people are talking about when all this happens and what's the context surrounding that. And really, moreover, why do we care? Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I am I am an attorney. I practice data privacy and security. I do predominantly consumer privacy, so I do a lot of things relating to data transfers, data collection. I write privacy policies that nobody reads, uh, terms of use that nobody reads, uh, and other sorts of fun things. Uh, thankless at times, but I think it's a lot of fun. I get to play around with technology. I get to learn about people that do really cool things. I'm sure some of you get to do that as well, so I think it's, it's a ton of fun. So this is a little bit outside of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, Last year, whenever the whole Apple versus FBI thing sort of uh, came to the forefront, I, I thought it was really interesting. So I, I kind of dug into it with Alex, and, and we started working on it. And, uh, and again, we just kind of wanted to bring, you know, wake that back up again. I guess I got to remember I don't have my power cable. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to kind of talk about it. So uh, forgive me if I'm not uh, super deep in my knowledge of uh, certain aspects of this, but I've tried to, tried to do my best to get it out there to you in, in a way you can understand, hopefully. So I was learning right there with you not too long ago. So. All right, again, I, I'm an attorney, uh, Andy Saylor, security over at Twitter, a genius, and knows a lot more about crypto. So whenever we get into things that might be a little bit technical, I'm going to save my dignity and let him do a little bit of talking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, and who do we hear? I'm not here to represent the law firm. Um, I'm, we're actually here on behalf of the Colorado EFA. Uh, it's a group loosely affiliated with EFF. Uh, what we're here to do is sort of, uh, we're a grassroots network of community members working to educate our neighbors about the importance of digital rights. That's what it says, right? What does that really mean? It means we're here to sort of be a sounding board for you to, to bring presentations like this and help you understand uh, law and policy and technology and things that are relevant to you and, and sort of be a local network, a place where you guys can come and, and join events and talk to us and, and be a little bit closer maybe than EFF can be. And, and I don't know, just uh, we want to connect you to what's going on and help you actually understand things better so that when you see things in the news, again, when Apple versus FBI comes up or when the next, you know, you know some acronym shows up in the news about cryptography and there's some law, you actually understand what they're talking about. And so we want to do this for all kinds of technology things. So, you know, keep up with us, coloradoefa.com. And there's some more information at the end if you're interested in getting involved, join the mailing list, things like that. Um, again, here for you. And so if you have ideas about things you want us to do, again, think through that and uh, you know, help us out. I'm happy to have you around. So with this presentation, what, what, what do we want to achieve here? Um, I basically, we want to get a point across to you, what is cryptography? Why does it matter? Like, why is this all important? Um, what roles has cryptography played in history? Why, like, how does all this come about? What is the basis for policy? Why? Uh, you know, why, why are things looked at the way that they are? Uh, you know, and again, so this origin and history, like sometimes that helps kind of provide a framework for understanding who, why it matters to whom. Um, and so how that law it impacts, encourages, or maybe discourages the use of, of cryptography. Um, and again, some of the key facets of, of things that have happened in the crypto wars and how people have worked to, to provide a little bit of law and structure around cryptography, cryptography or to break it. Um, and then again, you know, how to take action and understand policy. Uh, what this presentation isn't, I am not a mathematician, I'm a lawyer, uh, which means I, I can barely do basic arithmetic. Um, so this is not going to be a deep dive into cryptography, what it is, I, the differences between various cryptogra cryptographic algorithms, uh, you know, Andy can help you, but I frankly can't. <laughs> Um, and again, I'm not going to really get into a lot of the law of the modern surveillance state, uh, FISA and the various and the Patriot Act and things like that. Obviously relevant. But we're not going to get into that today. That's way outside of what I do, and uh, you've got to go to DC to find people like that. Similarly, uh, cryptography is relevant. So for those of you that are software developers, uh, cryptography, as you may know, is a, is a controlled export, uh, depending on various factors. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to do a deep dive on that. Again, it's a little bit outside my practice area. Uh, and it's something that, frankly, is way too much for probably even a one-hour presentation on its own. So uh, just 
be aware of that. Uh, this presentation is not exhaustive. Again, it's just an overview. And this is a presentation we'd like to give again. So if you see something you like, if you see something you don't like, if something's helpful or it wasn't, let us know. Talk to us. Um, we'll put these slides up on our website and everything else, and you know we'll keep it updated. So things you like, let us know. Um, so what is crypto? <laughs> and why am I here? Why is the, the dorky lawyer that doesn't know anything? Um, it's, I think it's good to understand exactly what crypto is and what it isn't. It's math, right? So kind of underlying a lot of these policy debates is this reality that crypto, uh, cryptography is math. It's, we're taking one, one string of digits and turning it into another using a, an algorithm. Um, can you break that? Um, so a lot of times there's a policy argument that's really divorced from this reality of the fact that it is fundamentally math and that you're asking for something that may or may not be possible technically. So um, I think it's always helpful to remember to keep that in mind. Um, where does it come from? Um, cryptography has been used in history all the time. Like it's been, it dates back to the Egyptian times. They used hieroglyphs even. They had modified hieroglyphs. They were coded uh, sorts of methods of communicating secrets. Um, so, and, and like, the, but modern cryptography a lot of times is related to this table. Uh, and this table, they basically, like rudimentary cryptography just shifted letters. Like you would take one, you would add four. Obviously fairly easy to decipher. And so people have often used these patterns of, of shifting letters and numbers and making it, uh, making it makes, make no sense on the surface. But if you knew what to look for, if you knew the pattern, you knew the code, you could decipher it. And cryptography has basically been the same ever since. Um, it was used heavily in like throughout history, like uh, Arabic cultures had a lot of used cryptography. It's been been there for thousands of years. Um, but again, the fundamental structure of it kind of is really similar. It remains the same. This idea of just shifting things around to a pattern and a code to make it decipherable. Um, cryptography also has really been something that's driven rights and freedom and personal expression for for as long as it's been out there. It's not just been some sort of military codes or secrets. Like we've Cryptography has been there for people and individuals and revolutions. Um, you know, it, in American history, we had it. The one if by land, two if by sea was you know rudimentary code, right? Um, and ciphers were common during um, during the revolution to to pass messages um, amongst the founding fathers and so on and so forth. Uh, Madison, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, basically every founding father you can think of, they were aware of cryptography and they used codes and ciphers to communicate and to help bring the revolution um, to bear. Um, so again, you know, it, it's, it's been something that not only it's been used for military purposes, but for a long time it's been used to preserve rights and freedoms and, and to advance cultures. And we see that a lot. You know, like throughout the world, even now with repressive regimes, you see encryption being the one thing that's really enabling activists or revolutionaries or people standing up against repression to allow themselves to operate and communicate. Of course, uh, cryptography played a huge role in World War II. Um, it was, it's been used in wars for centuries, obviously, like, you know, people communicating battle plans and everything else, we know that. Uh, but really, World War II was the point where cryptography became really, really sophisticated. We started seeing really advanced algorithms. These were not uh, sort of very, they, they were not so advanced in their ability. Maybe just somebody was, you know, really wise and had some sort of odd, you know, method for communicating, but rather that they, they were actually using complex calculations and complex mathematical formulas and computations and, and uh, to make these things work. Uh, and so it became almost weaponized at this point. Um, but again, the most famous example, the Enigma. It was uncrackable, like these series of wheels. I don't know how much. How did the Enigma work? Do you know how the, like? Yes, I mean, I stand up and go to the tire station. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I do think the thing to note here is like the Enigma was kind of our first venture into real computationally secure cryptography, right? Like yeah. it's in, uh, your key space is no longer the number of letters in the alphabet, right? Your key space is now, I don't know what the key space of the Enigma was, but you know, sufficient number of bits that you cannot mm -hmm. craft this in any kind of manual manner. Uh, and hence why we had to invent computers to break it. But. Yeah. So again, cracking the enigma, key to, the, key to our success in the Second World War. And also, it really did directly lead to, obviously, Alan Turing and his computer was used to crack enigma. And that, and that of course, underlies modern software development and modern computing. Um, so, and it was also, I didn't know this, it was actually relevant in the Pacific Theater as well. We had actually had cracked uh, the Japanese uh, cryptographic code as well. And that was influential in the Battle of Midway. Uh, so it was influential on both fronts. Um, and so again, 
you know, thinking about kind of two things here. Again, we see it, we see cryptography and breaking cryptography as being something that was, you know, relevant for freedom, but also on the flip side, uh, we see that uh, it's, it became sort of this militarized sort of thing. It became very critical uh, to have secure cryptographic methods. And, and so the government, at this point, you start to really see people getting involved and in, you know, regulating the way computers interact with it and, and using computers for code and everything else really starts to come to the fore at this point in time. Um, and so today, this is where I'm going to kind of lean on Andy a little bit. Why, what do we use cryptography for now? So we start, now that we have computers, we use cryptography now. Like what is, uh, you know, how does cryptography work and, and, and how do we use it in our daily lives and why is it so important to protect it today? Um, so, uh, in short, what would you, how would you define cryptography? Sure. Uh, so I'm sure you're all familiar with cryptography in our day-to-day usage, or, or if you're not, you're using it every day, you may just not know it, right? Every time you visit an HTTPS website, uh, every time you send an email that goes through Google servers or a more modern email provider, um, there's encryption at play, right? Every time you use the new chip on your credit card, that entire system is built on top of modern encryption. The fact that you can no longer just swipe and like go about your day, you just have to spend 30 seconds being annoyed at this machine that beeps at you when you're done. Uh, you can thank cryptography for that. Um, so there are a number of different kind of cryptographic protocols today. This obviously isn't going to be a lecture just doing a deep dive into cryptography. Uh, but it's kind of important to know cryptography falls into two main categories today. We have what we call symmetric cryptography and we have what we call asymmetric cryptography. Uh, and the main difference here is symmetric cryptography is what we were doing for ages. That's what the Enigma was, that's what everything prior to that was. That's where, in order to break a code, you have some algorithm, but knowing the algorithm isn't a problem. Uh, the thing that actually protects it is there's a key that unlocks that algorithm. Uh, and the same key is used to encrypt information that's used to decrypt information. Uh, this is great, this is really effective. The problem is you have to find a way to get the key to someone else, right? So if I want to send an email to Austin and we want to use symmetric cryptography, we can. But like, if I have to go over to his house to give him the key, then I might as well just tell him what I was going to tell him then, and it kind of defeats the purpose of email in the first place. Uh, so to kind of deal with this issue, to deal with this, how do you bootstrap a system where you may not be able to go and physically, securely exchange a key with someone, which is what you need for symmetric cryptography? Uh, we invented asymmetric cryptography, which came about in the uh, late mid-70s, mid to late 70s, is when a lot of this work was kind of being done in the math world. Um, that basically was a new class of algorithms that allow you to use, instead of one key, you now have two keys. Uh, you have one key that you can use to encrypt a message, but you have a different key that decrypts it. Uh, and you can do this in such a way that one of these keys can be shared publicly, so Austin can tell everyone in the world what the key is to encrypt messages to him. But then he can keep secret the key that he uses to decrypt those messages. So I can now go to his website, find the key that I used to encrypt Austin, use that to encrypt send him a message, but only Austin has the key to decrypt it. And I never had to go, like, carry a key to Austin to start. Uh, and thus we can do, we can actually encrypt messages. And that's what has enabled kind of this vast expansion of cryptography over the last 10 or the last 20 years that has really made everything we do on the internet in a secure manner possible, right? Like there'd be no web commerce without this because uh, you couldn't do credit cards online. There would be no uh, modern military communication without this because you couldn't send a message to someone in the Pacific Theater without literally sending someone to the Pacific Theater. Uh, so all of, our, all of our modern cryptography is kind of based off this asymmetric or this two key cryptography concept we still use symmetric cryptography under the scenes. We'll use asymmetric cryptography to exchange a key that we then use for symmetric cryptography. But without getting too deep into the weeds, that's kind of the basics of where we stand with crypto today. Uh, and that's how a lot of the systems we work with today work. And that's these algorithms you see up here on the board, things like TLS use, uses asymmetric and symmetric cryptography, um, wireless networking, WPA2, the password you have to type in when you join a network. All of this is based off uh, this kind of modern cryptographic concepts. Uh, but it is all this math at the end of the day. Like, there's just math here. Uh, and Austin will get into some of this, but banning cryptography like, is akin to saying it is illegal for you to carry out this mathematical operation, right? So if you, that's where it starts to get really interesting on, on the legal side. Uh, if people have specific questions on the crypto stuff, we can certainly dive into those at the end. But since this yeah. is the law focus, I'll pass it back to Austin, and we can kind of get into what, what the legal ramifications of having this technology that allows us to communicate in a way where it is computationally impossible for anyone else to break that communication, uh, what that actually means. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> so again, we, we use this again it's on networks. It's across the internet. It's every time you use e-commerce. It's your passwords. It's every network you join. Uh, and a lot of times it's data that you store. You can store encrypted data, like here on this laptop. It comes, it's encrypted by default now. If, you, if I shut this down and I lock my computer and somebody wants to go scan my hard drive, it's gibberish. No one knows, and my clients are happy about that. Um, so, um, blow off crypto. 
Um, so, like I kind of alluded to this earlier, after the war, uh, you know, computational technology really started to advance. We start to see an increase in the power of computers, computations that, you know, mathematically were possible, but humanly were definitely not possible prior to the, prior to the invention of computers. So we really start to see an interest in cryptography, an interest in government control, and managing secrets, and managing crypto, and managing code, and everything else. And again, you know, computers largely at this point were in the hands of the, in, in the hands of government. Uh, and, and again, as they started coming out, you start seeing, you know, a lot of control. And the first time that the NSA and the government really gets involved in cryptography is with the development of uh, the Data Encryption Standard, or DES. Uh, it's one of the early cryptographic standards, and it was, you know, the NSA and the NSF really kind of got collaborated together with industry to develop this, this single standard. Uh, some people think that, uh, uh, that maybe they had a role in weakening it somewhat so that they could continue to crack it. Um, but again, depends on how, how far in the conspiracy theory weeds you want to go on that. Uh, but again, it was a simple 56-bit key, very simple to, by today's standards, is long since obsolete. It can be cracked in minutes um, at this point. But again, this is really where you start to see the government and NIST and the, and the National Science Foundation and NSA all kind of getting involved in cryptography, in which they are even still today. Um, so as, as things develop, as, become, as cryptography becomes more important, I guess, to keeping secrets and to communications and military things, you start to see uh, the government exercise through other laws a lot more control. And so one of the things that, again, I, I alluded to this earlier, but as software developers, you may be aware of the fact that cryptography is still an export controlled um, product. Uh, there's certain, certain ways and certain purposes that you can't export cryptography to third countries. This matters when you're sharing code bases with your uh, with staff overseas. It matters when you put apps in an app store. Uh, Apple even has a workflow for some of this stuff, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, this all relates to the fact that for a long time, encryption was actually considered a munition. Um, I don't know if any of you can read the XKCD, but I really like this one. Um, so that for a long time, they, the joke is here that they thought that they should have kept it as a munition because then we could use the Second Amendment to protect our rights to crypto. Um, <laughs> but again, under this law, for a long time, it, it was a munition. Uh, that changed in the 80s and 90s as computers and the Internet sort of came to the fore uh, and e-commerce really. People started realizing that this was, uh, you know, there, there were the shirts that said, you know, you can't ban RSA. This shirt's banned. I can't wear this shirt outside of the country, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, people were just realizing how impractical it was, and there needed to be a different way of regulating it. So this, there's, there's this legacy that encryption is still for spies. It's for the military. It's a, it's a weapon. Um, and so this underlies a lot of these various things. And like I said, I, I'm not going to get into it just because this, this compounds itself exponentially throughout you know, various aspects of crypto. You have the Wassenaar Agreement, international treaties and things relating to how you use and disclose crypto. It's, it's, it's a mess. So um, if you ever need somebody that, if you need help with that, let me know. I'll find you somebody that can, that can help out. But uh, it's kind of where you need to know. Like that's, there's this, this field of law that's really sort of there and still dates back to this, these militaristic and sorts of origins of modern crypto. <laughs> um, but why, one of the things, what do we care about now? We care today mostly about the fact that we can encrypt our servers, our networks, our devices, and things like that. Um, so what, what other laws kind of come into play with cryptography? If we're not dealing with direct regulation of crypto, which is pretty much what you see with those export control regulations, uh, we don't need to get into standardization and things like that. But you know, how do we use it to protect ourselves? And, and this is, it's a constitutional issue at a certain point that we protect our, cryptography is used for us to protect our information, our rights, and things like that. There are Fourth Amendment issues, Fifth Amendment issues, and mostly it comes down to the fact that encryption is often used to defeat uh, law enforcement initiatives, right? Um, so this, <clears throat> this interplays a lot with the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. The fourth, for those of you who don't, who don't remember high school civics, it's the prohibition on uh, searches and seizures. Um, you can't be searched by the government uh, without a warrant. Uh, there are certain limitations to that, of course, though, right? At the border, we see this a lot nowadays, people asking, you know, what, what can I do to protect my information at the border? As some of you may or may not know, the border is, uh, the Constitution applies at the border, but uh, it's, it's pretty much the weakest place you can be in America with respect to the Constitution. Uh, it, your rights are very limited at the border. The, the government has a lot of control, and they can uh, a lot of they can search your device. Uh, there are limited. There are some limitations as an American citizen. There's only so much they can do. They can't detain you indefinitely, for example, at the border just because they feel like it. Um, but they can. They they have asserted the right 
on probable cause to search your device, and they don't have to have a warrant for that. Um, so again, there's this question now of whether, like, to what extent can, can they search? And so the issue comes down at the border, whether it's a routine or an invasive search. It's sort of a classical sort of question. Um, you know, it goes back to drug mules. Um, you know, you can't just search, you can't just make everybody strip search at the border, right? But you can if you see somebody who, you know, has, you know, thighs like three times bigger than they should be and, you know, they look like they might be a little bit coked out and their eyes are all ripped, bloodshot and everything else, perhaps we should search the guy for cocaine. Um, you know, you can do that. You have reasonable searches. And so now the standard is whether or not, you know, to what extent can the government search your devices? How routine is that? And the government has asserted that actually they have the right as a routine matter, just like they would have to scan your bag uh, to search your phone. And of course, we see, you know, we see that in conflict now. Sure. I don't know if you're going to get into this later, but at some point, can you talk about um, passports, whether they can be compelled sure. to mm -hmm. passports? Yeah, coming up shortly. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, whether it's an intrusive search. And so we have this other question of whether or not, what's an intrusive search? That's that make you strip search and see if you have cocaine. So the, you know, the counter argument is that searching your phone is akin to searching your entire life story. It's your entire life history. It's all your communications, everything. Um, so there's this ongoing sort of rich debate, but, uh, and, you know, balancing. Again, the government's need to access information, people crossing the border, where did you come from? Were you, why were you in Syria? What were you doing with your phone in Syria? Uh, you know, these sorts of questions versus, you know, are you just a journalist? Like, you know, do you have sources to protect? Are you just a regular human being who just needs to, who's just trying to go and visit family? Um, and so again, we also see this in the criminal context. Some of you might be familiar with a recent case called, uh, uh, it's called Riley versus California. And the question is whether or not the government can just search your device anytime that you've been detained or not even arrested. Just uh, like there's a traffic stop, for example. Can they search you? Can they search your devices? Um, and the answer to that question, Riley resolved, is, is no. Um, historically, you know, of course, you know, when you've seen people get arrested, they're like, you know, put your arms out, you know, everybody gets the pat down. Historically, like if they found a slip of paper in your pocket, they could reach into your pocket, take a look at the piece of paper, and you know, it's like a phone number, and it says, you know, drugs here, you know, something along those lines. You know, and th so they're like, we got it. You know, we didn't, and they didn't have to get a warrant to go through your pocket and find the drugs here phone number. Um, Riley says that the phone isn't like the piece of paper in your pocket. The phone is everything. Um, you know, and you can't, so you actually do have to get a warrant. They can take your phone, but they can't necessarily open it and search it. So, again, we have a little bit of protection under Riley, but again, this is why cryptography still becomes important. They can get a warrant, and, you know, we assume, we like to believe in, in the U.S. that that's justified, that when they have a warrant, they should have a, you know, maybe they have a right to access, maybe this is founded for good reason. Obviously, in some countries, maybe not. <laughs> Um, so again, this is why cryptography is so important. It's what protects you in the event of some of these searches, in the event that they're unjust or something along those lines, or maybe the cop just doesn't care. Um, so, uh, and then the Fifth Amendment. Uh, this is against, everybody knows, plead the Fifth, uh, but it applies to a little bit more than that. It's not just, you know, being sat up on the stand and grilled for, you know, for hours. It's also, you know, when, the, when they access information about you. So, it's whether or not the government can demand you provide them information. So, like, let's say I have on my phone that sort of, you know, I have that number, you know, you know buy drugs here, um, you know, but I don't want to give them that number because then it indicates that I've gone off and been, I've been buying drugs, right? Um, so what can the government do to compel me to, to open my phone, uh, you know, to your question there? Um, and there's, there's this old... Everybody, we kind of go back to old laws here and these old sorts of things, but the, old, the classical case is whether, how do you open a safe? Like, and can the government compel you to open a safe? You can't hold, like, so let's say in that safe, I have, you know, the phone number that says buy drugs here. Uh, can the government force me to turn over a key? Yes. So that's not, it's not considered a testimonial communication for me to, hand, to, to say, you have to hand me the key to this safe. Um, however, if it's a combination safe, Precedent tells us that they can't compel us to regurgitate that, that combination. If the safe is locked with a, with a strong combination, I forgot. Um, and you can't force me to tell you the combination to that safe. Um, and so this is what we're seeing now um, a lot of times with, with searches on phones and people arguing that the Fifth Amendment protects their right to be incriminated and it protects their right to not have to decrypt their phone, not have to put in a password and open their phone. But it's come into play now uh, this old sorts of combination versus key locks has come into play with, uh, you know, with modern iPhones. If you have your, if you use a thumbprint, just like the government can, you know, whenever you get arrested, everybody puts, you know, you put your hand on the thing and they take your fingerprints and, and everything else. You know, nobody's ever said that, you know, you can't take, they of course did try to argue that, hey, you can't take my fingerprints. Like, 
Both here, they can. Putting your fingerprint is not a testimonial communication, as it turns out. This is something that um, doesn't require any effort, doesn't require any thought, doesn't require any creativity. You're not testifying to anything. It's just an imprint of your body. And so they've taken that to mean, and in certain cases, and in most cases, I think at this point, uh, that your thumbprint can, like, they can force you to open your phone if you use solely a thumbprint. The lesson, of course, here is that if you're an activist or if you're in a foreign country, which I guess the, you know, these, the Constitution doesn't apply, but, um, you know, but again, if you're, if you're arrested or if you care about what's on your device and you care about the government maybe coming after you and looking through and rifling through your stuff, uh, the thumbprint may not be sufficient. Use an actual passcode. Um, so, but it's an interesting, interesting case and interesting to see how all this sort of develops out of, out of the old keys and, keys and combinations. Just to be clear, passcodes, you're allowed to say that you can't have them. You forgot? Yeah. <laughs> um. uh, when the, the, there was a case with the San Bernardino shooter, mm -hmm. who the, the, there was a whole case where the government tried to sue Apple to hack into his iPhone. Right. He was dead. So, yeah. you know, what was the deal with that? We're going, to we're going to talk about that because that's actually a little bit different and it gets outside. Of there. You're right that there was no constitutional Fourth or Fifth Amendment case here. This was actually, uh, Apple was the one asserting it. Um, so it had nothing to do, yeah, it had nothing to do with his rights. It was all about Apple's rights. So on the Fifth Amendment point where whether or not you can be forced to or whether or not you can be compelled to disclose a passphrase or uh, decrypt a device, we have seen some cases where people have held contempt for refusing to provide such a passphrase. So, this kind of, I think this is still undecided it to is, some extent. Which is a great point. A lot of this is undecided. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with legal procedure, we have you know, the various circuits throughout the country. We're in the 10th Circuit here, 9th Circuit in California, and there's you know, another 9 or 11. How many? 11. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but each of these circuits, they have their own precedent, and then it's, they resolve that when it goes to the Supreme Court. So most circuits have come down on the fact that uh, they've, they've followed this interpretation, but not all of them. And so in certain cases, uh, you may be compelled to disclose a password. Um, and there's a... What is it here? Uh, I don't know if the 10th Circuit's actually ruled on it offhand. Um, sure, in the back. Yeah, it might be a bit of a rabbit hole, but um, this all only applies to American citizens. Is that correct? American citizens and green card holders uh, have most of the rights, although when you're here, even as a non-citizen, uh, most of these rights would apply. At the border, it's very different. The border is really where that gets very tricky. You have very few rights as a non-resident uh, crossing the border. So if you have friends from Europe that are just coming here for the heck of it, good luck to you. They can force you to disclose those social media, you know, social media account information. It's uh, it's difficult. Sure. Uh, so at the border, they, can they compel you to disclose your passcode? Um, they try. They try. Uh, but but again, you can forget. And so that's what a lot of people do. And then the answer, the answer in any of these cases, uh, the second to last point, which we can't see it, uh, in any of these cases, say no and demand a lawyer. Just say, no, I would like a lawyer. Nothing else and say exactly that. No, and I want a lawyer. Not, I think a lawyer, I think I might want a lawyer. Like it can't, you can't equivocate, just tell the government, I want a lawyer. No, and I want a lawyer, and go find one. Um, if they, take, they may take your phone, and they may impound your phone for months. Uh, you know, but if they can't get into it, they can't get into it. Um, so yeah, what does it mean to compel me to get a passcode? So if I had a border or I'm in a court proceeding where the judge rules that yes, I do have to get a passcode and I say I forgot, what's going to happen to me next? You may be held in contempt. If you've been ordered to do it, I, I believe you'd be held in contempt. So that would be the... Uh, it means that you have refused to comply with the orders of, of a court. Uh, you, to go home that night <laughs> you may you may have to go to jail. They may it depends. On, they, I don't know how long you get stuck in jail. I don't I don't do criminal law. I try to stay as far away from that stuff as possible, you guys. Uh, but again, you, you are held in violation of the law. You do have to follow uh, what the court orders you to do, and so they 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 can lock you up. Uh, but again, the question is whether or not that's even legitimate to begin with. Um, so. Again, sort of the last point here, again, if you, know, you can say no, but that doesn't mean that you'll ever get your phone back. Um, they may take it, they may seize it, and they can kind of do whatever they want um, once they have it. They can, try, they can try to crack it, but of course Apple tries to prevent them from doing so. Um, so again, it's a complex issue. So what, but again, this is why cryptography matters. Cryptography is here to protect you against, you know, again, we assume that the government's out for, for good purposes and, and you know, probably has a reason to get into the phone. But if you ever doubt that, you know, cryptography may be the last thing standing in the way between you and you know, your entire life story being spilled to some, you know, some officer or some court or somebody you know, that, want, that demands your information. 
Um, we also see, oh, sure, go ahead. Sorry. But don't they have to have, doesn't the person who is competent to border or whatever, don't, don't they have to have some probable cause to ask you for that? And that's one of the things that that's, we they would. They can't ask you just for the heck of it, can they? They can ask. <laughs> and the answer, the answer again is no. And so this is one of the debates now is that, um, they have asserted that this isn't an intrusive search, that it's akin to scanning your bag. They, they say, I should be able, you know, some of them have argued, I should be able to scan your phone and just see if you've made contact with known terrorist agents, for example. Not that big a deal, just like I should be able to scan your bag and look for a bomb, right? But again, you know, my view, and I think the view of a lot of people, is that, that's, that looking, looking inside my phone is fundamentally and materially different. That's the invasive search. That's the strip search that you, know, that you can't do without probable cause. Um, I was just, just thinking, gee, you know, if it's a slow day at that checkpoint at the airport, <laughs> can the adults, their idle curiosity, yeah. can they just look around and see what's going on? Yeah. Sounds like they shouldn't. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's some of the arguments. They shouldn't, and, and again, say no. Just say no and ask for a lawyer. If they take your phone, it's better than taking everything that's on it. Um, sure. Uh, I've never been in this situation before, but I have heard from stories of people who have uh, tried to say no and ask for a lawyer and felt like they were compelled to, you know, they were left for hours, missed their flight, left without food and water until they eventually cracked. Like, how much of that is just like, TV dramatization, and how much of that is actually, how, how practical is it to say no and ask for a look? Uh, and, and that's a great question. And honestly, this is how, this is one of the reasons why CBP asks the case of whether or not, you know, if you were to take it to court as to whether or how invasive that search is, it's not a great case for the government, right? Uh, and, and we have Riley, if we look back at that sort of balancing act between personal rights and the government's right to access, you know, it doesn't weigh heavily in favor necessarily of being able to randomly scan everybody's devices, but they do have the bully pulpit. They can say like, you know, well, I'm just gonna harass you. I'm just gonna say, no, your lawyer's not gonna be here for several hours. Like, I know that you need to get to LA and you're stuck at JFK. Like, right. you know. Um, Are you have to choose between convenience mm -hmm. and yeah. Standing up for your rights. Yeah, and so yeah, and so for a lot of people, a lot of people do just just bend over and say, "Go ahead and scan it." Like they do, it doesn't, you know. If you're not a journalist, you're not a lawyer, you're not somebody with protected communications on your phone or something along those lines, or an activist of some kind, um, you know. The, a lot of people just say, "You know, screw it. I've got nothing to hide." And you know, thanks for looking through all my phones. You know, like, great. Like, have a nice day, I guess. Um, you know, and I get on their way. But again, it's sort of this. Um, it's a difficult relationship, and uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that's why cryptography. <laughs> we hope that's why cryptography. Uh, if they can decrypt it, uh, is the question. So, like, if you don't provide a passcode, like, so on my phone, for example, just like my computer, once I lock it, you can scan it. And assuming that someone doesn't exploit a vulnerability, there's it's you know it's gibberish. Um, I believe so, yes. I and mean, I'm not certain about that. I'm not quite sure of the technical capabilities, but I would assume that it's technically possible that once it's decrypted and plain text is visible on the device that you can download plain text information. Um, but again, you know, that's why, that's why, this is why cryptography is important again, because, you know, if without that passcode, everything that comes off the device is completely gibberish, and, you know, with, you know, unless you're the NSA, maybe. <laughs> um, and so again, we see this uh, uh, communications in transit. We kind of talked about where we use cryptography. Uh, we use it a lot in, in, in transmission. Uh, HTTPS basically allows for encrypted communications, authenticated communications, and it, and it helps ensure that your communications are you know, complete and accurate and from and to the people intended. Um, and so, so we see this again. Uh, I'm not gonna really talk too much about this because it's not super relevant and I think we're burning through time. Um, but again, there's uh, the ECPA, uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, uh, applies to a lot of these communications. This is another law that comes into play here. It's how law enforcement can access uh, other forms of communication, right? Um, and so, and the Wiretap Act. Uh, these are the two things that we'll see. Um, the Wiretap Act basically prohibits the government and individuals from tapping live communications. Uh, it doesn't stop them from a technical level, but there is some, it's a very high standard. Wiretaps are very hard to get, uh, which is one of the, probably one of the stronger protections. Um,
but it's important to know that there is this law called uh, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA. We'll see it come up a little bit later uh, in the presentation, but it basically requires telephone companies to uh, allow the government to tap. They have to provide some mechanism for the government to tap a phone line, uh, whether it's to install a pen register or to sit inside the switches and sit on top of that switch and get information off of it. Um, uh, so, but again, it only applies to telecommunications carriers. It doesn't right now, or at least arguably, apply to, um, to ISPs and, and various other providers. So you, they don't have to, like ISPs, for example, don't have to provide cops a way to, um, to, tap, your, to tap your internet connection. Uh, but of course, that hasn't stopped the NSA with uh, FISA, X key score, and various things that, uh, you know, various laws and technologies that the intelligence services use may or may not be possible. So, and that's, this of course, you can't see it, but this is what the NSA was doing, breaking. They actually broke SSL at a certain point um, to get information. So, uh, NSA can do it, but again, it's important. It's important in keeping your communications confidential from people and, uh, and governments, uh, whether you're in the U.S. or elsewhere. Was this... Uh in effect, the San Bernardino cell phone, Apple cell phone issue? Uh, Kalia? Uh, yes. Kalia is an old law. Both of, uh, so the Wiretap Act, I think, dates back to the 60s. Uh, it was updated. The ECPA updated uh, several laws, but among them was the Wiretap Act. So it basically it covered various technological intercepts uh, and updated it in that way. Um, and Kalia has been around, I think, maybe since the 70s. Does it also um, apply to ham radio? I, that I do not know. Um, I would, I'm not sure. I don't think it applies to radio because I think it applies to, I think it's predominantly focused on switched networks, just standard old phone lines uh, is the general thing. And so that's one thing that we'll see is a lot of the, none of these laws really have been fundamentally updated uh, to the modern world. Uh, this one in particular, the Stored Communications Act, again, the ECPA amended that, uh, but it was, this was in 1986. And we use it a lot for email, but it creates these really arbitrary distinctions and allows the government to access a lot of information, uh, you know, maybe without a warrant even. Sure. So I, I'm not clear on something that you just said. I think I kind of missed it. So on CALEA, you said that it, the CALEA does not apply to ISPs, but that the NSA can? Uh, the NSA has the technological capability, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, CALEA doesn't. CALEA is not the law that's used for the NSA. Uh, the NSA is, is doing it under espionage laws, FISA, and things like that. Uh, CALEA is more relevant in standard law enforcement, and it comes up in the Apple versus FBI case, uh, which is really one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring it up, because the scope of CALEA and what it requires uh, kind of plays into whether or not uh, you can force software companies to decrypt their products. So it it really applies to the telecommunications providers, but what it enables, it enables local law enforcement to tap phone lines. Uh, so basically, the phone companies have to provide a way so that when law enforcement has a warrant, they come to the they go to Bell. You know, back in the '80s, they'd say, "Bell, I have a warrant for you know so and so's uh, you know so and so's communications. You have to let me put a tap on it." You know, and. and <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> no, there, there are, but the question is, you know. Uh, but they're not enforced. Right? So there's no, like, there's no power over a word of the NSA? Like, nobody's regulating what they're doing exactly? I mean, they should have checks and balances, but those really don't have to be done. Yeah, we, and this is, this is why I stay away from the FISA courts and, like, <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it's complicated. And this is why this is why I can't I can't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so again, and so the Stored Communications Act. This is one of the quirks. I bring this law because it's actually something that uh, Congress might actually do something to fix. Um, it's it's been around for a long time, and it's one of the reasons why again cryptography is important because uh, it's one. There's a loophole basically under the ECPA that allows for email that has either been unopened for 180 days or unopened that's in storage that you can, at least in theory, access that email without a warrant. You can only, you can use a subpoena, which is, which requires a, it's a lower standard, right? Uh, basically requires you think that a crime was going on, not that you've had to prove some actual, like you, ha you haven't presented to a judge an actual indication uh, that a crime may have occurred sufficient for you to get a warrant. Uh, you can use a subpoena, again, a lower standard, so you can basically subpoena certain records from phone companies or from email providers and things like that. And so a lot of people have seen this loophole. Various courts under the Fourth Amendment uh, have limited that to a certain degree. But anyway, there's this loophole. Some of the states are trying to fix it. Uh, but again, it's one of the reasons why I, I like to bring it up, just because encryption helps solve 
you know, it helps protect you from this loophole. Uh, but while I'm talking about it, it's important also to know what the Fourth Amendment doesn't cover and what uh, even the ECPA doesn't really address, which is metadata and things like that. So the classic, the classic example of, um, is with a letter. Like you take you know, the address on the letter. Everybody can see the address on the letter. It's the contents of the letter that's protected. What's not protected, you know, the, the addressee and your address, that's not protected, right? Uh, and so what we've seen here, and so searches and seizures only apply when you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in whatever that document is. So courts have found that with emails, that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your emails. So maybe they have to get a warrant anyway, that the subpoena requirement doesn't, meet, doesn't pass constitutional muster. Um, but where it doesn't apply is metadata. And we've also seen this in some cases with, uh, with uh, cell, phone, cell site registrations. That was the really interesting case out of last year. One of the ones that I thought was fascinating was that there was a drug dealer driving around Maryland and they actually subpoenaed uh, from the phone company his cell site registrations. And so each cell tower has three, it's three little antennas. And so they could tell which antenna he was connecting to at which cell site. And they were able to track him around town just like they'd put um, a bug in his car. It was literally that effective. They pulled thousands of uh, daily, they could basically track his movements all around Maryland. And they did that with a subpoena without a warrant. Normally you'd have to have a warrant. So, the, but they said that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy when your phone is connecting to a public network. You know, your antenna, the connections of your antenna, you don't have any privacy to that, right? Or do you? So we don't know. But so far, the cases are coming down that you don't have that reasonable expectation of privacy. And so, really close to location data. yeah, exactly. And so, you know, to, to, you'd have to have a warrant to get all that location right. data, but. And they're getting cell sectors installed on the location, mm -hmm. location. Right. And so they're able to basically deduce with almost perfect geolocation accuracy, or not perfect, but good enough. Um, sure. Um, I think they have to, so I'm not, I'm not so sure about stingrays. I'm going to hold off on that one because I'm not really familiar with the law surrounding the use of stingrays. I know that a lot of it is, there, there are current cases going on and it's not faring well, I think, in a lot of cases, the use of stingrays. And they're also trying to legislate that. Um, but stingrays are basically fake cell sites that you can use to intercept traffic. But the reasonable expectation of privacy does come up and that's why I wanted to bring this concept up because for all of this, whether or not the government has the right to search your stuff, it comes down to whether you have an, a reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. So metadata, often you don't. Uh, conversations we have in public, you don't. Things like that. So I have some software that uploads lists of like email address as geometry, which is I guess encrypted. Do I have to do anything about that with the government? Or um, no, uh, as far as I know, I don't think you would have to do that. Again, that's not going to be metadata, and that can, that's going to be content. You know, whomever you're sending it to would be the metadata uh, that would not be protected. But whatever, if you encrypt that message, assuming you comply with export control requirements to the extent you're sending it to someone overseas or something like that, um, you know, that, that would be what comes to mind. But just in general, with respect to, there are no laws of crypt cryptography that would apply in that context. And I don't so you should probably respect geographic boundaries initially. Yes. Yes. Um, and so again, um, and this is all in flux, so keep, keep, keep your ears out for ECPA. They often uh, just stick a, stick a state name in front of ECPA, like Colorado ECPA or uh, CalECPA was the one that passed in California, again, fixing that loophole in the ECPA. Um, so the crypto wars. Those of you who were uh, cognizant of things, unlike myself, uh, in the early 90s going on with crypto may have heard of the crypto wars and the clipper chip. <laughs> Uh, this was really the, uh, the NSA's first attempt to want to break encryption, uh, break consumer level encryption. And so what they did is they basically designed this little chip that would be able to decrypt communications. And it used this, this concept called key escrow, where they would basically have a unique key that they would, would be able to decrypt the communications. And th in theory, only the government would have, have access to that key. Any of, you, any of the software developers know like, that uh, software is buggy and, and it was pretty shortly thereafter that people figured out that, the, that you could find the key. You could pull the, the escrowed key and you basically anyone could decrypt the communications and you weren't just giving law enforcement access, you were giving it to anybody who could figure out how to break the system. Um, so this caused a lot of controversy. Uh, a guy named Matt Blaze uh, basically proved this theory that it was insecure and the crypto wars kind of went away for a while. Um, but yet, sort of in the background, there's this original initiative, people always think, like, what if there's just this magic key? There's just gonna be this one magic key that's gonna be able to decrypt everything and the government should be able to have it. This works, right? Um, and I think since this time, everybody's had it, in, or at least the government, has had it in their mind that this is the best way to do it. 
uh, or that this is technologically possible. Um, so things simmer down, and we come into sort of modern history, and we see, uh, okay, oh, I'm running out of time. Um, so yeah, what we see now, so we're going to get to the Apple case. A lot of times um, people are worried about going dark. The government's worried about it as uh, computers, computers have really uh, sort of, the, the power's increased, the internet's increased. Everybody's been able to, to use and implement strong cryptography. Uh, and so people are worried about uh, basically everything being encrypted all the time, every device, every network, every connection, all of this being encrypted. Um, and that's what happened with, in San Bernardino, the guy's phone uh, was encrypted. And, um, and so Apple did that by default, and the government couldn't get in. Um, and so what we, had, what, what we had here was, of course, the guy was dead. He didn't have any privacy rights. He didn't have any Fourth or Fifth Amendment rights. He's dead. Um, and, but the FBI still wanted access because they wanted information off the phone. And so this, is, this was the interesting case where the FBI wanted to force Apple to decrypt the device. They said, we want to enlist your help in... Um, and getting into this device. Apple, of course, has three security measures. The time entry limits, each time you enter a password, it exponentially increases to the next time you can put in a password. Uh, theoretically, if chosen, you can wipe the device on 10 incorrect attempts, and you also have to put in the number with your hand. You can't use a computer to, to randomly ping passwords uh, in serial. So, so the FBI said, well, we don't know. We know, we know that option, you know, one and three, we know that these are in place, and number two probably could be in place if you actually cared about the information. So Apple, we want your help. Uh, and Apple said, no. <laughs> um, and so they had a warrant, of course. So keep in mind that this, there was an, a validly issued warrant. The court, and for good reason, right? He's a terrorist. Um, so what happened? The court used what's called the All Writs Act. A lot of people, I got a little, little bit frustrated at the time because everybody's like, well, they use this old law like, to try to get into the phone. It's not an old law. It's just like saying a court's not valid because it's old. It, uh, the actual law they used was implemented at the same time as the court system. It's called the All Writs Act, and basically what it allows courts to do is fill gaps uh, and force you to do something to give effect to a valid, in this case, a validly issued warrant. So it says you need to help execute the warrant. But obviously there are limitations. Um, and this is where Kalia came back in. Uh, you know, Kalia doesn't authorize specific design of an operating system. And so in this case, what F the FBI wanted to do was to force Apple to develop a custom developed and signed update to the phone. So they could put one off, they could install an update because it couldn't, like once you turn the phone on, it could force an update to the phone without decrypting it. And they wanted to force an update that would allow them to try unlimited passcode attempts that, and to use a machine uh, to do it. Uh, so they could basically hook it up to a supercomputer and hit and just um, and hit it with every password they could try. Uh, and so some of the arguments were that Kalia doesn't authorize that. The, state, the, t the statute says it doesn't authorize it. Apple, of course, says that prohibits it. The FBI says, well, it doesn't prohibit it. It just says it's not expressly authorized, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, tons of fun. Um, but of course, uh, also in this case, it was whether or not, you know, whether the court had jurisdiction to require this. I'm not going to get into that. It's kind of an interesting argument, but since I'm short on time, I'll kind of glaze over it. Uh, but basically, all it comes down to is whether or not it's unreasonably burdensome for Apple to do this. And so this, we got into this really nasty argument over whether it was objective, whether, whether it was reasonable to force Apple to create this software. And the argument was that, of course, Apple you know, is sitting on three quarters of a trillion dollars and um, you know, what's, you know, what's four weeks of developer time? Uh, but, the, but the other, the flip side of this is, once they do it for somebody, the FBI wanted precedent. The FBI wanted precedent to show that you could use the All Writs Act to demand decryption, and that you could demand the ability to force dictionary attacks on uh, via the OS. And um, fortunately, they dropped the case uh, because they hacked it. Uh, so. So they bought an exploit. Uh, the rumor is that they paid $1.3 million to a shady individual uh, to, that knew an exploit in iOS, and they used that and cracked the phone. They found a flaw in the encryption mechanism, and they were able to, uh, to decrypt the phone. Um, it's rumored that this exploit would only work on an iPhone 5C, so if you have anything up, uh, that exploit's not available, but don't, don't think that there's not one still hanging out there somewhere if the government wants to buy it. So don't be a terrorist. Um, it's still expensive. Um, <laughs> Right. So yeah. That had some kind of cost other than just 
time they spent to do it. Right. And so there were two, there were two key points. One is that, uh, that it would create and release into the wild an operating system that was fundamentally insecure. And so everybody wanted to say, there's no way you'll ever keep this under wraps. Uh, you, know, you can't force us to develop insecure software. And as we all know, even the NSA can't keep their exploits secret. Um, <laughs> They're not Apple. <laughs> <Right>. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. but, but Apple is going to conveniently argue, at least in this case, that they, they can never be sure. And then, of course, the second point is, uh, you know, how many thousands of police departments across the country are going to be sending their devices to Apple and say, well, you know, you know Apple Apple's going to say, well, the one thing that we have to do to keep our product secure is keep that OS in-house. We're never going to send that. We're not going to send our OS to some, you know, to Podunk Police Department. Um, but I, I thought the Apple case, the San Bernardino case, was different because it wasn't the shooter's phone. It was. So there was an argument that they had, because uh, it was a government phone. Yeah, that he was argument, phone. There was an argument that, um, that mean, he had I already, already, he had already. I signed a paper that says they can get anything on it. Yeah. That's part of what I get when I get a phone. Yeah. And that was all part of it. But again, they, the, the, the order in question was the All Ritz Act order against Apple to execute the warrant. Uh, so there was a, a valid warrant. So this was the most direct mechanism because it was encrypted. And they wanted to find a way to force Apple to break it. Um, and so the, basically the option was to create an insecure operating system. Was the, wasn't there an early operation with the device that actually made it a lot harder or something? Uh, that was, it was rumored, but it, it was a 5C, that's secure enclave. Uh, and that feature was in 5S's and above. Uh, but it was in, in the 5C did not have secure enclave. And so that was actually not entirely true. Uh, but people thought that it might be the case. But when this, once they confirmed it was a 5C, they, they backed off of that a little bit. Um, so again, uh, at least in this particular case, we ended up where the government had to pay a ton of money, and it's really infeasible for them to replicate this time and time again, because um, it costs a ton of money to hack into a phone. So unless you're a terrorist, they're probably not going to be running exploits on your phone. Um, and so the question is really, what are we seeing in the future? Um, we've seen uh, over last year, we had the Burr-Feinstein bill. Some of you may have heard about this. Uh, it was a controversial bill. Um, basically, what it was going to do, it basically would force providers to be able to f have a method to decrypt uh, devices. It also is going to prohibit uh, any service from being released on an app store, for example, uh, that did not properly allow for decryption of data. And the way that they worded it, it was actually going to ban TLS. <laughs> you, uh, Mozilla and Chrome uh, would not be able to implement properly TLS because it didn't it, it, was, it was not able to decrypt everything that happened in the past. Over It was a technologically ignorant bill, uh, and they tried really hard to get it, and then fortunately a loud chorus of technological voices uh, informed them that this was really pretty stupid. Um, so, uh, but again, they argued, they tried to say that such technical, such technical assistance as is necessary, and this included software providers. For those of you that are software developers, you theoretically could have been ordered under this bill to find a way and, and have a mechanism to provide support to the government to decrypt and make available certain communications. Um, so always look for these things. When you see this reasonable assistance stuff, who's going to be, who's in charge, who has to do that? And what do you have to do? And are they asking you to break math? <laughs> um, hopefully not. Uh, the UK, apparently the sound doesn't travel very well over the ocean, and they passed it anyway. Um, and so this allows uh, for capability with one P and not two. Um, uh, so you have to allow for the technical capability of decryption. We haven't seen a lot of how this is going to play out in practice. But know that the IP bill in the UK does have some extraterritorial application. This is probably one of the most severe um, anti-crypto bills in the Western world. Um, and it's very new. So we don't quite know exactly how that's going to work, what assistance levels are going to be provided or forced upon uh, vendors, software providers, and things like that. But do know that uh, this is not going away. Um, and so, again, there's some, there is a national security limitation to all of this. They can't just be doing it just for the heck of it. Uh, I don't believe, and don't quote me on this, but I don't believe that it applies in, say, low-level drug cases. And so this is something else where you want to look. You want to look at what triggers these obligations. Is it terrorism and fundamental national security matters, or is it literally any court in any jurisdiction doing just about anything? You know, can they for, are they forcing compliance for, you know, for drug dealers and things like that, relatively low-level relatively low crimes? Um, so again, we've seen, we've seen some quiet following the Burr-Feinstein bill. Um, a couple weeks ago, Comey, before, while well, he still had a job, um, was talking about this. He did express some support that a solution still needs to be found, the scope and, and nature of that. Uh, I think the backlash from Burr-Feinstein last year really actually had an impact. And this is kind of why I want to 
bring this up to you guys and to pay attention and listen for this stuff because it's it's the voices of reasonable people pushing back against this that helps kind of keep this at bay and keep people reasonable and focused on what uh, what really matters here. Um, he was quoted as saying that nobody wants back doors, which you know is is a great thing to hear the FBI director say because he was arguing pretty hard for one last year. Um, so perhaps people are coming to the realization that you shouldn't break math. Um, and again. Um, you notice we see again with backdoors, even if you have them, uh, patches don't work. That's the whole, uh, what's it, wanna cry, wanna crypt thing uh, that's been going around the world for the last week or so. Um, every, the NSA had an exploit. Uh, they patched it back two months ago at this point, and uh, it's still infecting thousands of computers around the world. People don't patch. Uh, whether they should or not, they don't. And so these vulnerabilities, these backdoors, these exploits, they do get out and you can't keep it under control. Even if you patch it, it, it leaves thousands of people and, and obviously the whole NHS in the UK vulnerable. So um, we kind of talked about the things that this bill might have. So again, think about things that you can use to protect yourself. Signal, Tor, I have them on my shirt. They're fun. Uh, but they're encrypted messaging systems. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in a place where you are worried about internet surveillance, use Tor. Uh, you know, it's not the same internet experience you'll have on a regular browser here in the US, but if you're, if you're a journalist and you're worried about being spied on by the government, um, you know, these systems can really help you. Um, encryption really is there to kind of support your privacy, support freedoms and everything else. So, uh, and if you're a website owner, uh, use HTTPS everywhere um, or Let's Encrypt, uh, the uh, program of EFF, helps, helps you stand up TLS on your website, helps you have HTTPS and make sure that you have encrypted connections. Have that, by, have that as your default. Keep, give a little bit of privacy to your users and, uh, and kind of help them out there as well. So uh, if you want to learn more about the technologies, we have them listed on our website, efacolorado.com. We have a technologies tab. EFF has them as well. They have a whole list of fun things that you can do, uh, ad tracker blockers, if you're interested in that sort of stuff uh, and everything else. Even and with WhatsApp is that even if you can't get it out, even if you have Kali Award and you cannot get anything. It, exactly. Message, yeah. Because it's, it's device encrypted. It's it, end to end encrypted. It's end to end encrypted, and that's what these are important for. Like it doesn't, they, they avoid those switch networks. Uh, Kalia may not. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, so whether, whether you think that the government is just out to get you or whether you're in a place where, where the government may actually be out to get you, um, you know, these, these are the services that are out there to help protect you. And it's all based on encryption and you know, that's why this stuff is important, right? Um, and again, of course, engage, talk to people. When you, see, when you hear about cryptography, when you hear about laws focusing on this stuff, speak up. Um, you know, talk to us, talk to the EFF, call your congressperson, you know, these things matter. Um, and it's, it's through your voices really kind of speaking out that I think makes a difference, and that's what helped last year. So um, thanks. Sorry I went a little bit over time, but, uh, you know, questions? I think we have, there's no event budding up after this, but we only have five minutes left in the hour, so like okay. five minutes of questions sound good? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no problem. Could I just ask? Sure. Uh, so the question for those of you who may not have been able to hear was asking whether I, as an attorney, use any particular method of encryption uh, for my client communications. Uh, normally, no. As a matter of general practice, I usually don't. Uh, the attorney-client privilege is extremely strong. Uh, so the ability for someone to access it without, without having target, you know, without me being a target of, of say, the government or a highly sophisticated attacker, uh, from, from a government access standpoint, it's almost untouchable. Um, it's very strong. Uh, so although we do, I mean, I do use, I have PGP available for my clients if they want to use it um, and things like that. But I, I don't use anything in particular, and, and I'll be honest with you, law firms, uh, <laughs> they're not really particularly technologically sophisticated. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's, it's really hard, and they have a long way to go. I'm, I'm pushing for it at my firm and for other firms elsewhere, but it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> Well, that's good. I'm happy everybody knows about it. Yeah, it's kind of a pain, but it's, it's. Was it really? I didn't realize that. Huh. Cool. <laughs> exactly. Sure. What's up? Uh, so, pace of technology and change is accelerating. Um, do you have? Have you heard of any ideas or movements uh, 
that law can keep up with that pace of change, um, like cryptography and cryptocurrencies? And with cryptocurrencies, I'm not very familiar with cryptocurrencies. I'll be very honest with you on that point. Um, to me, one of the I think the best things are generally kind of deferring to standards, deferring either to private standards in certain cases or just having general principles and allowing some sort of flexibility. You see it with, for example, how the FTC regulates security is through reasonable security. That's all they really require. It's a, it's a simple sentence. And what's, deter what's reasonable is determined in large part by the market and capabilities, cost. They allow, they basically, for something to be required under an FTC standard, there has to be some sort of assessment. They have a cost-benefit analysis that they put in place, and it forces that. So I think that those sorts of adaptable regimes are good. Uh, the next best would be something like PCI, where you actually have a standards body that's actively refreshing, updating, monitoring, and keeping track of a security standard, for example. And so that, that to me, is the best way to do it. But um, you know, it's, it's, it is really hard. <laughs> Sort of been interesting, interested since, uh, I guess since uh, Donald Trump was elected, um, there's been lots of prognosticating uh, about leaks, uh, not only from the government, but also uh, allegedly Russian hackers infiltrating the, the emails of private of individuals who are associated with political campaigns. Mm -hmm. and, I'm just, and we also, I think, saw a big dump uh, of documents for, after the French election. So I'm just wondering, like, among the people in your field who are, uh, you know, of lawyers, are you seeing any more, like, sophisticated defenses against people getting into their organization and potentially ruining their clients' reputations or anything like that? You know, frankly, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, I should be, but we're not. Because the, the, to me, law firms represent a, a very vulnerable target. It's a lot of, you know, largely older people. Uh, not technologically savvy people, you know, regardless of age, um, you know, people that are just not comfortable implementing technologies or are not familiar with it, just don't understand the risks. Um, they're just, just not, and yet they handle extraordinarily sensitive information a lot of times. And they, and I have seen a modest but very minor uptick in the way that people care. What I've really seen most is my boss and I. We do information security trainings and stuff for lawyers, and we just basic ethical stuff. We've seen an increase in interest in people actually wanting to hear more about it, wanting to learn. And then, so we're seeing like baby steps, but it's, it's moving very slowly. So I mean, I'm going to ask you to speculate here, but would you say that that trend will accelerate and continue? I'll, I can tell you what will cause it to accelerate. Okay. <laughs> when, it's, yeah. when it's a domestic firm and not Mossack Fonseca that gets hacked and somebody breaks open um, massive, uh, you know, a massive client issue. Uh, at this point, we've had, we've, to my knowledge, we've had no major blockbuster law firm data breaches. Uh, you know, the big firms, a lot of the ones dealing in, in the super high value international, like some market sort of stuff, like if you think stock market trades and things like that, insider information to me would be, is what I think would be one an early target. Um, and so a lot of those firms actually do a pretty decent job, like your Golden Circle New York firms do. Okay. They do okay. Uh, but it's, it's small and mid-sized firms that are really, it's really difficult for them because they don't have the financial resources a lot of times and, or, or the awareness and capability. Is a lot of that published uh, publicly eventually though, the law information? Uh, well, so in a securities context, obviously you have certain disclosures uh, under SEC rules, but, uh, but what we're worried about is before, before it becomes public, there's a lot that's very confidential, insider trading. So what they, so they want to do is get the information before it's public so they can trade on it. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm honestly really surprised we haven't seen. And maybe it's happening and we just don't know about it. <clears throat> A single source? No, I, I try to get um, for 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 what specifically? Just like uh, news on uh, legal developments and cryptography. Or like that. So I would track follow the EFF. Uh, the EFF is does a good job. Uh, Epic uh, also has a lot of great resources. They have a lot of great back background resources and things like that. Um, uh, trying to think who else. Um, there's the FPF. All you know, all your nonprofits that focus on privacy. Those are pretty good. Uh, I actually use something called, there's Benton's News Service. They're actually a communica telecommunications originally, but they actually do a really good, I get their daily newsletter, but they do a really good job of summarizing privacy, security, and telecommunications law developments, which you know obviously overlap with crypto and, and security and stuff like that over time. And frankly, uh, find smart people on Twitter. Um, a lot of times things don't surface, uh, or they surface in various different places. Uh, smart people on Twitter sometimes just following infosec nerds on Twitter. It actually is kind of useful. <laughs> so should we do one more question in the break? 
sure. unless there are no more questions. All righty. Well, thanks so much All for right. coming out. Cool. Thank you.